Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. There we go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is 11 o'clock, so we're going to get started. Uh, welcome. My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Agriculture Extension Agent here in Prince William County, and welcome to this week's class, which is Putting Your Garden to Bed. Our speaker today is Christina Hastings, who is part of our admin team here, but she's also a master gardener. And hopefully you'll get some good information out of this. As you have questions, please put those in the chat box. And I think that's everything. So Christina, whenever you're ready, go ahead and start. Great. Thank you, Thomas. Um, good morning, everyone. As Thomas said, I am a master gardener. Um, I've been a master gardener here in Prince William County for about four years but I have gardened uh, most of my life. So um, most of it I learned from my parents. Um, so here we go. Uh, and I hope that um, this will be helpful to you. Maybe we'll go. Okay. There we go. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, the Virginia Cooperative Extension is a partnership between Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. And our mission is to provide research-based information to the public. We have several programs within um, our office, including um, parenting, financial management, nutrition, and youth development, in addition to the environmental and natural resources. What we're going to cover today, um, is a little bit of everything. Uh, there's a lot of information, um, and we'll probably just scratch the surface on most of all of this, um, but we do have either, we have already have videos um, for some of this, or we have some upcoming videos, which we'll share with you during the presentation. So let's get started with annuals and bulbs. So the first thing um, I'm going to recommend, and we always recommend, is soil test. Fall is a great time to do a soil test um, because you can, if you need to add any amendments to your soil for your annual or perennial beds or your vegetable beds, um, you can add them in and by the spring you should, your garden should be ready to go. So for annuals and bulbs, um, you definitely want to go pull any weeds before you they go to seed. Um, I've done some of this already, but um, I obviously I'm going to miss some. Um, for And you want to pull out your spent annuals, but you want to do that after the first frost. So for tender bulbs, um, such as dahlias, pale lilies, gladiolas, you should dig those up and store them for the winter after the foliage dies, which is probably after the first frost. So you want to dig um, very carefully to prevent any damage and several inches back from the base of the plant. Then you want to lift the clump out. Um, try to avoid cutting or bruising the bulbs and take special care um, for the skin of the dahlias tubers. Um, the pathogens can readily enter through injured areas and cause rot while they're in storage. So you want to loosen the roots gently. Um, and I usually take a garden fork um, or even my fingers and just pull them apart, knock some of the dirt off, shake off the excess soil, um, and then pull them gently apart. And then when I get them apart, I wash off the bulbs uh, with a gentle stream of water and then discard any damaged bulbs that you may have. You want to let the bulbs dry out for a couple of days. Um, there are some bulbs that may need to dry out or cure longer, depending on what the weather is outside. So you want to keep them out of direct sunlight and in a well-ventilated area. Uh, temperature should be about 60 to 70 degrees. If you want to store your dried bulbs um, between two and three inch layers of peat moss, sand, vermiculite, sawdust, wood shavings, or you can use the shredded coconut 
uh, husks. If you have a lot of bulbs, you will want to layer them in a ventilated container. Uh, you can use a cardboard box. Um, my mother always used to use uh, milk crates and layer her bulbs in those. Um, don't pack the bulb, bulbs in an airtight container. Um, the moisture will build up, will build up and promote decay. So you want to make sure the bulbs are not touching. Otherwise, if one starts to rot, then it'll, it'll carry on to the others. Now is also a good time to divide um, your spring blooming bulbs and try planting some newer ones. So um, some good bulbs to have are alliums, uh, daffodils, crocuses, tulips, grape hyacinths. Um, these bulbs can be planted in the fall up until the ground is frozen. And once we have a freeze, you want to double check the bulbs for heating um, just to make sure. Um, hardy bulbs should be planted at least two to three times their height. So you want to make sure that you also have a slow release fertilizer. Most bulbs perform better in organic matter. So after your soil test, um, if, it's, if it says you need some amendment, um, you could use something such as bone meal. Uh, usually phosphorus is sufficient in our soil here in this area. You could also try um, some annuals and bulbs in some containers, uh, mix them with some perennials. Uh, this is great for people who live in apartments, townhouses that may not have a lot of space. And um, we have a great uh, Audubon at Home publication called Captivating Containers with Native, native Plants. Um, it will give you all different kinds of plants uh, that will work well with uh, bulbs, natives, native perennials, and annuals. Let's move on to perennials right now. So some gardeners are like to clean up their perennials and have a uh, you know, very clean garden. Other gardeners like me uh, leave my garden, leave a lot of garden, the perennials. So most perennials are better left standing over the winter. Um, they provide uh, attractive foliage uh, they, and the seed heads provide foods for food for birds. Um, the stems of perennials also offer a place for the birds to hide in the winter. Uh, some of the marginally hardy perennials, if you leave the stems up uh, in the winter, it aids in their overwintering and the foliage helps insulate the crowns. Mums are, um, seem to benefit a great deal from this practice. So cutting back the perennials in the fall may be something you want to do, um, especially if you're bothered by a foliage disease. Um, you will want to remove the old foliage, um, which would be positive in this case, as it helps reduce the amount of inoculum present and to reinfest next year's foliage. Removing the foliage can also be purely aesthetic. Um, like I said, some gardeners like to have a nice clean garden. Um, I found years ago that, quite by accident, that frankly, cleaning the garden gave me, not cleaning the garden in the fall, gave me a little more time to do some other things. Um, and it turned out to be pretty. We had snow that year, and um, some of the uh, seed heads from the uh, echinacea and uh, rutabecchia looked really pretty in the snow. If you do cut your perennials, make sure you do that after they are dormant, um, usually after the plants have experienced several hard frosts. Cut them about two to three inches from the crown. If you, if you cut too close, it can result in winter injury on some of the perennials due to the fact that buds for next year's grow right at the surface or higher and not below the soil line. So here are a few of those perennials that look kind of in the fall and winter. Uh, Northern sea oats, um, 
They give some movement as well as color. There's the echinacea with a little snow on it. And of course, the beta vector. And one of the best things uh, for not cutting your perennials, like I said, is the, um, it provides food and um, habitat for our birds. Of course, when you're cutting down, if you're cutting down, make sure you save some seeds for next year for your garden. Um, we, our next uh, class on Wednesday is seed saving. It'll be October 27th. So make sure you tune in to that. You also want to um, divide your perennials. This, oops, sorry about that. Uh, this is a great time to, buy, to divide your perennials. You want to use clean, sharp tools, and you can clean your tools by using one part bleach to nine parts of water. Dig around the plant um, in as large a soil ball as possible, and then you want to lift that clump up and divide it into the smaller bulbs. And when you're doing that, gently, as we said before, gently you know, tease the roots out um, so that you don't damage any of the roots. If it's too, if the clump is overgrown and the roots are tangled, um, like I say, you can use a uh, garden floor or uh, your fingers to gently loosen the um, roots. You want to um, discard any of the less uh, older portions of the plant and save the newer ones uh, for replanting. Make sure the roots are healthy. A uh, healthy root should be white and sturdy and not slimy. For both perennials and vegetables, um, you want to remove the diseased or when you remove the diseased uh, plants, do not put them in your compost pile. It's best to bag these and dispose of them. Most uh, internal temperatures of most home compost piles don't reach a high enough temperature to kill plant disease pathogens. So diseased organisms and weed seeds aren't destroyed. And so it's best to just dispose of these, um, bag them and dispose of them. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about vegetables. I'm not going to go too deeply into vegetables because last week we had fall vegetable gardening, and you can view that video on our YouTube channel. Again, you want to test your soil. Um, this, as we said, it's a good time to uh, add any amendments. It gives it time to work over till the spring. Um, you, if you have perennial vegetable and annual veg, you would probably want to do soil tests, uh, separate soil tests for each one. I don't know if you all do this or not, but I do. Um, and I would recommend doing record keeping of what you planted in your garden. I have a gardening journal that um, I record every year. Uh, what I have, I have four vegetable raised beds. Um, I record every year what I have in those beds. I also record in my perennial and um, annual beds when I plant, what I've planted. I put some little notes sometimes of how it's done, uh, you know, over the year, if it's, you know, uh, you know a diseased or if it's um, done really well, how it's growing. Um, but in the vegetable garden, uh, you want to rotate your crops. So this is a good way to keep track of what you have in each bed, particularly if you have several beds. So vegetable planting, um, good vegetables to plant in the fall. You can plant garlic and rhubarb. Um, there are some other cool weather crops that you can plant. And of course, we recommend using cover crops. Um, a lot of this, like I said, I'm not going to go into detail. We did a fall vegetable um, video. It was posted on our YouTube channel right now. So you can see what you can um, plant. You can still plant this fall. If you aren't going to plant any vegetables, we recommend veg, uh, planting cover crops in your vegetable garden. 
Um, this will help the soil. Add nutrients, it helps suppress weeds, uh, pr provides nutrients to the soil. Um, these are just some of them. Um, you have winter rye or cereal rye, crimson clover. Um, I like crimson clover, and I usually plant that with the cereal rye, um, mainly because I like the, the flowers. I, I like to look out my window and see the clover uh, blooming in my garden. Um, cover crops also uh, can stabilize the soil, reduce erosion and soil compaction. Uh, they provide a lot of organic matter, um, and it is beneficial habitat and food for beneficial insects such as our lady beetle and assassin bugs. If you are going to plant some vegetables um, and want to use some season extenders, we did uh, talk to, about that in the fall vegetable gardening class as well as our greenhouse classes. Um, there are several different kinds of season extenders from greenhouses to uh, cold frames, uh, row covers. I have used, personally used some row covers and have been able to plant things like um, broccoli, spinach, uh, have some radishes, and um, I planted uh, cabbage. I didn't do too well, but the other, all the others did very well, and I had them up until about January of this year. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about trees and shrubs. I'm not going to talk, go into um, too much about planting trees. We do have an upcoming um, Zoom on tree planting. Um, that will be on November 3rd. Um, but it is a great time to plant trees and shrubs. Um, they do very well, um, better in the fall, planting in the fall. Uh, you just have to make sure you water them quite a bit. Um, so it's a good time for deciduous trees. You can plant more transplant both. Um, they are dormant at this time of year. Um, if you are looking for a shrub that lends a lot of fall color to your landscape, my personal favorites include a red twig dogwood. Um, they have uh, white flowers in the spring through summer, and then they turn into berries for the birds. The leaves turn a really pretty rust color in the fall, and when the leaves fall off, you have the red twigs in the winter, so they, they provide some color in your garden pretty much year-round. American Beauty Berry is also a good one to plant. It provides uh, food and shelter for birds and insects. Um, you do want to uh, prune away any dead or diseased branches on your um, trees or shrubs. And for more information on when is a good time to prune, we uh, have updated pruning calendars. Uh, they were just updated recently, and you can find those on uh, the website, resources.ext.pt.edu. And we also have copies in our office. And here are the um, publication numbers of those resources. So there's, there's three different ones on the page. So as the fall comes, the leaves start to fall. Um, so you want to leave your leaves. I know a lot of people don't like that, um, but we would suggest uh, raking them into a natural area, using them as compost, putting them under your trees. And it's a good way to recycle nutrients and compost, which can improve the soil. So leaves account for um, a huge amount of yard waste that you might need to deal with before the winter so that you are not smothering your lawn. And they can cause, um, encourage rodent activity and promote snow mold uh, diseases. So you want to um, not leave uh, heavy layers of leaves on your lawn. They are good 
Uh, even though they might seem like a nuisance, they are a good resource that can be used to for mulch and soil amendments. Um, you can also mulch the leaves uh, with a mulching lawnmower. It cuts down on the labor and returns nitrogen to the soil as the leaves decompose. You may have to do this several times throughout the season, though. Um, so, but I would save the leaves as much to use as mulch. Um, they're great. Uh, for your annual and perennial beds. They're also great for your vegetable beds. Um, a thick layer of chip leaves can be an effective way to suppress leaves and conserve soil moisture. as bark um, better than bark mulch. And they usually will break down within a season and build organic matter. Um, shredded leaves do not provide the same cover and um, I would not recommend shredding the leaves personally. Um, they are, uh, there are some of our insects are good insects like the red banded hair streak, the lightning bug larva, and others depend on the leaf litter, um, leaving them whole. And if you're shredding them, you may be destroying eggs, caterpillars, or chrysalis along with the leaves. We have a great um, podcast by Mike Goatley um, on fall leaf management called Leaf the Leaves. Uh, this is the, um, if you go to ext.bt.edu and then go to the Lawn and Garden and um, Google or put in the search fall leaf management, uh, this podcast will come up. And he talks about, um, you know, garden tips for lawn leaf management. And that brings us to compost. Let's talk about leaves for composting. So if you're building a compost pile for your garden, um, you want to make sure you add the green and brown um, and some chipped wooden materials. There are a number of things that you should not add to the compost pile, um, which is listed on the probably the right of or left of uh, your screen. Um, some green materials that are rich in nitrogen and protein um, tend to heat a compost pile up because they help the microorganisms in the pile grow and multiply quickly. So grass clippings, vegetable and fruit peels, manure, cow, chicken, rabbit. Uh, my granddaughter has a rabbit, so all his uh, manure goes into my compost pile. Um, you can put weeds that have not gone to seed or that have been sprayed with a pesticide in, uh, coffee grounds, and then the trimmings from your, the non-diseased trimmings from your annuals and perennials. Some brown carbons include, our browns are carbon or carbohydrate rich materials. Um, and they include things like the leaves, twigs, branches, you can use dryer lint, cardboard, uh, paper, coffee filters. But um, if you use paper, do not uh, put in magazines, catalogs, wrapping paper, that kind of thing, just plain white paper, or even uh, newspaper as long as it's got um, the vegetable. Here are some resources um, on composting, our Virginia Tech publications. Again, you can get those off the resources.ext.bt.edu website. Or you can come out to the teaching garden and visit our compost lead, uh, Patrick Lucas, on how to make compost. We have several videos um, on our website about videos, uh, turning compost, vermicomposting with worms. Um, so there's, there's a lot of resources out there on building compost beds. And finally, um, we're going to go in, well, this, the next thing is repairs and chores. So some of the things you want to make sure you do so your water pipes don't freeze is winterize your hose beds. I mean, shut off the hose bed valve from inside your house. Uh, drain and detach your hose. 
You make sure you store the hose in a in your garage or a shed. And you want to keep the faucets on. Um, you can also cover the faucets. I, I do this with the um, you can get the styrofoam covers at Lowe's or Home Depot or any hardware store. Um, you want to sharpen your lawnmower blades, your pruners. Make sure you have them cleaned again with the one part uh, bleach and nine parts of water. And um, repair, it's a good time to repair or build any kind of garden structures you might need for next year so that you're prepared in the spring. And find you want to dream and plan. So you can do winter sowing. Um, you can sow annuals, bulbs, perennials, vegetables. Um, I have a winter sowing class coming up. It will be December the 15th. Um, we also have a current video on our website for this. Um, I've tried um, winter sowing some of the some perennials, um, native perennials such as uh, butterfly weed. Uh, I did some milkweed, so, which worked out very well. Uh, and I always do my vegetables uh, winter sowing. You can also schedule an Audubon visit, um, and our Audubon ambas ambassadors will visit your home and walk, do a walkthrough, um, what your vision is for your garden, um, suggest some plants. You can help uh, plan a bit, develop an area that might have been bare or bare, or maybe you just want to change it out from um, non-natives to natives. And you can do that by contacting our Master Gardener devs or um, going on the Audubon at Home website and filling out an application. So to do a wrap up, uh, you want to pull any weeds left in your garden before they go to seed. Um, you can prioritize removing and discarding the disease top growth. Um, make sure you leave some healthy seed heads dried stalks and leaves. Um, they add different dimension to your garden when the snow falls. Some ornamental grasses will add color and movement into the winter landscape. Um, while cutting everything back might look neat and tidy, a lot of perennials are better left, um, better left standing over the winter. And in addition to the, uh, again, as the having act uh, attractive foliage and providing seed heads uh, for birds. They offer food sources as well as um, habitat for the birds. Uh, stems of perennials that left in place, um, the birds will like to hide in that as well as some of our uh, native insects. Uh, some marginally hardy perennials, if you leave the stem, it aids in winter overwintering and it helps insulate the crowns. Cutting back perennials in the fall may be something you would want to do if again um, some of the foliage is diseased. But here are some reasons not to clean the garden too much. Native bees need a place to spend the winter and they're protected from cold where they're protected from the cold and predators. They hunker down in places like peeling tree bark, bark, excuse me, and they may stay tucked away in the hollow stem of bee balm plant or some ornamental grasses. And they spend the winter as an egg or larva buried in the ground. Butterflies, well, monarch butterflies uh, overwinter in Mexico. Some of our native butterflies stay right here. So, um, and overwinter as adults. They nestle in rock fissures under the tree bark and in the leaf litter until it get, until spring. Uh, and butterflies will overwinter um, in several stages, but either in the chrysalis stage, which the swallowtail family does, um, or they and they can be found hanging on dead plant stems or tucked in the leaf litter. While other butterflies, the caterpillar will roll up in the 
a fallen leaf or stay inside a seed pod of a host plant. So if you're cutting them down, you, we could be eliminating overwintering places for our pollinators. Another reason to not clean your garden are predatory insects such as the ladybugs, assassin beetle, assassin bugs, lacewings, and other ground beetles. They sleep in our gardens as adult eggs and uh, pupa. When the temperatures drop, native lady beetles like to spend, or ladybugs, spend their colder months under leaf clouds uh, or at the base of a plant or under a rock. So leaving your garden intact will jumpstart controlling pests because ladybugs are pest eaters. And then we have songbirds. Many of our songbirds um, eat uh, insects uh, that they find in the uh, stalks of our native, of our plants. So chickadees, titmice, bluebirds are welcome in the garden because they consume thousands of caterpillars and other pests, insects, as they raise their young in, our, in the garden. Not cleaning up the garden means there'll be plenty of protein-rich insects for them. Um, and finally, the people will make Mother Nature very happy if you don't clean up your garden. So here are some, um, to wrap up, here are our, you can find us on our teaching blog, teaching garden blog, Instagram, Facebook, of course, our website. And you can always get information from our Master Gardener desk at Master Gardener at pwcgov.org. We have not changed our website or our email addresses yet. Um, I think I skipped a slide. I don't know where it went, but I have a list of the classes that we have coming up. Um, October 20th, we have ground covers. October 27th, as we, I stated, it may have seed saving. On November 3rd, we will have tree planting. November 27th, uh, back by popular demand, holiday arrangements. On December 8th, we have, uh, we're going to have a session called Garden Goodies, where our master gardeners will highlight some of their favorite garden gifts for that gardener on your Christmas list. And on December 15th, we will uh, um, do winter sewing again. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope I gave you a little bit of um, information to not clean your garden. <laughs> Uh, but if you do, um, that's okay too. So, thank you all for attending. I so the only me. question we had, um, well, actually we've got another one. Uh, so we had a question about um, how long should you leave the leaves of daylilies? Or actually what should we do with the long leaves of daylilies, which the help desk was kind enough to uh, respond and with pruned back to about four inches off the ground. Um, our other question is for crimson clover as a ground cover, if you plant it one time, do you have to worry about it receding? I, I only had that issue in one problem, but in one area of my garden, but it kind of didn't matter to me because I was going to plant more anyway. Um, and it it really, I don't know why it only did it in one bed and, <laughs> and not the others that I had. So maybe I, I don't know, maybe I pulled it out. But I let mine go and um, just, I let it dry up and just stay there and then plant around it because it acts as a weed cover. Yeah, crimson clover is usually I mean, you you can let it go long and and let it drop seed, and it will put seed back up. But it's it's not one of those things. It's not like buckwheat, where if you let it go to seed, you'll have buckwheat coming up um, for sure in, in heavy doses. Uh, crimson can is you know if you've got a couple of crimson that, clover plants that come back up, they're easy to pull, so they're they're not really that aggressive. 
Do we have any other questions? Not seeing any. Thank you very much, Christina. This has been a great talk. And thank you all for coming. We will see you next time. We'll be talking about ground covers. And have a good week. And we'll see you. Thank you, everybody. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. For more information on lawns and gardens, please contact the Extension Horticulture Help Desk at mastergardener at pwcva.gov. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.